Okay? All right. Well, <clears throat> as has been customary throughout this, I'm going to be impolite and steal a minute from Michael okay. because I have to say how overjoyed I am to be able to share this occasion with Shimon and Eliezer. We go back all the way to the early 70s when I first met Shimon when he became a, a young postdoc at Slack. <clears throat> and he introduced me to Eliezer. And since then, it's been my, my joy to collaborate and discuss physics with them throughout the years. Um, so the amazing thing when I looked at the pictures, and I'm sure you'll all agree, is none of us have changed in the intervening years. And uh, so I have to, have to say one thing, which is, uh, ah, good, Eliezer's here. As, uh, I want him to hear this. <coughs> I know none of you would guess it, but I originally come from Brooklyn. And not from the tribe we successfully exported to the Holy Land, but a different group. But nevertheless, um, the lingua franca when I was growing up, so to speak, was Yiddish. And in Yiddish, the best thing you can say about a person is that he's a mensch. And that speaks volumes. And so I don't have to repeat all the silly things that I heard everybody try to go through about their talents and their careers and their uh, things. I just want to say to Shimon and Eliezer, uh, my uh, two young mention that uh, I welcome you to what the Chinese call the age of maturity and wish you a long time gaining wisdom. <laughs> I now have the pleasure of introducing Michael Dine. Since Lenny gave us the green guy to the landscape, I think Michael is now going to give us a tour of the art galleries. He's going to talk about symmetries in the landscape. Okay. <laughs> well, of course, it's, uh, it's a great honor and privilege to be here. And let's see if I can work this and go in the right direction. So I, rather than show pictures of the young, uh, of, of the young Eliezer and Shimon, I thought I might I just put up something that refers to their uh, many accomplishments, the silly things that people have been saying, as Marvin says, all through this, and just say happy birthday to my friends, colleagues, and to two distinguished scientists and citizens of the world. So. Um, so I'm going to talk about symmetries and particular thing about symmetries in the landscape. And we heard, can everyone hear all right? By the way, my voice is a little weak, but okay. Uh, but uh, uh, and we heard, you know, we had a you know a, a, a nice, if somewhat controversial, introduction to this, which I appreciate. So I don't have to uh, explain lots of things here. Uh, but I, I want to focus on one particular aspect of, uh, of the landscape. So so Lenny focused a lot on the question of how we might think about cosmology and the, you know, conceivably observational, conceivable observational consequences. And I'm going to think, be thinking about uh, con possible consequences of this view of nature for lower energy physics. And I'm not going to say too much. I'm going to stay away from the, the dreaded word largely. I think I checked. I only use it once. Uh, but, uh, but, I, but in a more general sense, I want to think a little bit about what this kind of view might imply for physics that we might encounter, and, and on my mind very much is physics at the Large Hadron Collider, things that we really might, might see in, 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 uh, in our lifetimes, in Shimon and Eliezer's lifetimes, and, and so on. Uh, so I've known Eliezer and Shimon also for, you know, it's approaching, I'm afraid, 30 years. Uh, and during this time, we've all thought a lot about symmetries, supersymmetry, gauge symmetries, discrete symmetries. And I've learned a lot from both of them about things like uh, the role of anomalies, the realization of gauge symmetries and supersymmetry in field theory, I guess, uh, and also in string theory. I, I thought I would tell two little stories. Uh, in the summer of 1983, uh, she, well, first of all, Shimon, not the number of us here, uh, some of us not here, were waiting the birth of our children. I was in Israel in the summer. Uh, and during a, Tel Aviv, a visit to Tel Aviv on a very hot and muggy day, Shimon asked a lot of probing questions about the instanton computation of the superpotential in QCD. And I remember that discussion actually leaving quite alarmed that this whole story, which Nati and Ian and I developed, might, uh, might not really hang together. Uh, and actually, by the time I got home, I, I, realized, I, I had understood what, what the issues were. 
And this was actually the first intimation for me of the interesting dynamics of n equals 2 theories. And not much later, Eliezer introduced me to the work, some of the work which we actually heard about yesterday of Witten and Olive. So the, these two have been, for me, a source of stimulation and excitement for a long, long time. Uh, in 1988, Nati and I realized that T-dualities of heterotic string theory are gauge symmetries, and we soon learned that Eliezer Amit and their collaborators had understood much the same. Uh, and there have been many other areas of overlap on many visits here and on visits of Eliezer and Shimon to the, Shimon to the U.S., uh, and never mind discussions of all kinds of other things. So let's see if this works. So uh, I want to talk a little bit, as I said, I want to talk about symmetries. And, uh, uh, and I was thinking about this. Symmetries have been sort of a dogma in particle physics, certainly through our, most of our careers. The notion, you know, so symmetry is a good thing. If it's there, it's natural, it's nice. Uh, it might explain something. Uh, and as I was thinking about this, there was an article in the New York Times about the Pope. Uh, and I was reminded that the Pope was actually the professor of dogma uh, and the history of dogma. So I thought that was quite a title. Uh, and I was also thinking, we're in the Holy Land, and I don't want to just make allusions to, I want to be kind of uh, ecumenical and not make allusions to just one religious tradition. Uh, uh, and I also noticed he had this interesting post. Um, so in, uh, anyway, in my experience, neither Elias or Noshimo is dogmatic about much of anything. But I say, during these decades, it has been dogma that symmetries are a good thing in particle physics. Uh, we've talked about supersymmetry, gauge symmetries, discrete, discrete symmetries as natural and reasonable uh, as explanations of hierarchies, of fermion masses, of features of physics beyond the standard model. Okay. Now, in string theory, these questions are often sharp. Okay. So, so in some sense, you know, when we talk about this in model building and field theory, as a model builder, we say, okay, that's a good thing. In string theory, uh, these questions really are, are often well posed. We can ask whether symmetries emerge. And in critical string theories, we know that, for example, there are no global continuous symmetries uh, as expected uh, in a theory of gravity. Uh, gauge symmetries arise by many mechanisms. Uh, N equals one supersymmetry as conjectured to solve the hierarchy problem arises. And discrete symmetries arise in string theory. And generally, these can be thought of as discrete gauge symmetries. Okay, so, <clears throat> so, uh, so, so these sorts of questions have already some, some kind of answer. Okay, but until recently, it's not been clear in what sense or what to make of these observations. Okay, so in what sense are in any of these features generic? I, this goes back maybe to, to Lenny's remark about, well, there are a million calabiales or something like that. But, that that, you know, but, what, but what does that mean? What did that mean? What were, what were we talking about? Okay. And so are these reasonable ex expectations of how string theory might describe the world around us? Now, the landscape provides a framework in which to, to think about all these questions. Okay? And there are lots of issues. You know, I think, uh, as you could hear from the rumblings in the previous lecture, there are lots of things about the landscape which are controversial. The very existence of this vast set of states can hardly be viewed as reliably established. The mechanisms by, for transitions between them certainly is not well understood. Uh, but for the first time, one way or another, we have a model so I want to think of this sort of as a model rather than necessarily that we yet are in, in, entirely in control of the truth in which to address a variety of questions. And the model, and, and with this sort of model, there are equations, there are things we can, we can study, we can try and look at. Uh, and I claim that the easiest questions to study are precisely those which are associated with questions of symmetry. So are, do symmetries emerge easily? How do they arise? Uh, are symmetries somehow special? And these questions can be addressed in what I'll call model landscapes. And for me, a model landscape is going to be, for those of you who are familiar with, with this story, going to be something, things like the landscape of the 2B theory, which has been so well studied. Okay, so that's what uh, we're going to try and do today. Okay, so, so some questions look, so a lot of questions in the landscape are hard. Some questions look relatively easy. So for example, one easy question which I'll take up today is how common are discrete symmetries? And I'll argue that, that, they're, that they look expensive. Okay, so symmetry we say is nice and we often impose symmetries, but within the landscape they're rather rare in a sense which we can make precise. Only a tiny fraction of the states exhibit, for example, discrete R symmetries, which I'll, as I'll explain. Now, a harder question has to do with supersymmetry, and I'm not going to answer this today, but I'm at least going to try and describe it. Uh, 
approximate n equals 1 supersymmetry, for example, is, is something that we know, and that you know, um, Michael and others, Mike Douglas and others have done lots of counting of and so on. So we know there are lots of states which have a pro n equals 1 supersymmetry or approximate n equals 1 supersymmetry, but we know very little about the states which don't have supersymmetry. Okay? And there are, it's been conjectured that there are lots of them, and, uh, and uh, we're not going to be able to answer that here. I'm going to at least describe some issues. I'm also going to ask a primitive cosmological question. So I, whenever I talk about counting, uh, uh, people jump all over me and I say, how do you know that counting is the important issue? And you, we heard from Steve, unfortunately, this Steve's talk, but we heard from Steve, you heard from Steve the other day, about, one, about ways we might understand something beyond counting, okay, by thinking about cosmology. Clearly, cosmology is critical to understanding what, what might emerge from this landscape story. Uh, and, uh, and I'm going to ask, the, though, a sort of a, a much more a primitive, a very primitive cosmological question, a question about metastability. Okay. So a candidate state, so, so people sort of count states, what do they mean? They count, they look, say, at some kind of effective action, some semi-classical effective action, and they find stationary points, and they count the stationary points with a given property. Okay. So, for example, with small cosmological constant. Okay. Now, but that's not the only question we'd like to know. Okay. So, for example, a state with small cosmological constant is a, typically going to be surrounded, as I'll describe, by a, a very large and possibly exponentially large number of states with negative cosmological constant. And it better be true that uh, the system cannot decay to any of those, cannot decay rapidly to any of those states, to even count it as a state, much less to view it as a candidate for the world we, set, we see around us. Okay, so I want to ask what kinds, of, I'm going to ask what sort, under what sorts of conditions are states protected from these kinds of decays? Okay. So what are some of the known classes of states in the landscape, some of the kinds of states we want to think about? Well, we know about states that there are lots of states with n equals 1 supersymmetry. We know there are states with weak string coupling. We know there are states with large compactification volume. That's what I mean here. Uh, states with warping. Uh, states with approximate moduli. And these are the states, these are sort of among these states, I'm going to ask which ones might generically be stable okay, or, sta or metastable in the sense I just described. Uh, and I'll report some preliminary investigations of these classes of states. And there's some not well, not, not on my part, at least well understood connection with some of Steve Schenker's remarks. Okay. Now, almost all of what I'm going to describe is rather tentative. As I explained to people, I was uh, in preparing this talk. I was thinking not only am I worried about whether various statements I'll make are correct, but whether even the questions are, are sensible. But I will, uh, I, I will uh, beyond this, indulge in one conjecture that certain symmetric states might be cosmological attractors. So I'm going to come back to this question of whether symmetries are, 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 are special. Uh, it's at the moment hard to establish, but I think I'll argue at least plausible, okay, and relatively simple, a relatively simple issue within the space of ideas about string cosmology. So that said, let me talk about, first a little bit about supersymmetry in the landscape. So I think I'm going to come around here because it's really hard to stare up at this screen. Okay, so uh, in the 2B landscape, there's an exponentially large set of flux state vacua which exhibit n equals 1 supersymmetry. Uh, there's also an infinite possible set of choices of fluxes which do not, okay, uh, which do not yield supersymmetric states. And Douglas and Deneff, for example, have counted these by introducing a cutoff on the scale of supersymmetry breaking. Okay? And then when you do that, you find that most of the states okay, are very near the cutoff. So in other words, there's a large class of supersymmetric states or approximately supersymmetric states. Okay? And there's a large class, possibly much larger, of non-supersymmetric states okay? with scale of Susie breaking of order uh, whatever is, if you like, the fundamental scale of the theory. Think of this as the Planck scale. Okay? Uh, and, th and there should be, and this point has been stressed by a number of people, there might be vastly more non-supersymmetric than, than supersymmetric states. Okay. So this question sort of we thought for, again, for this 25 or 30 years or whatever, that supersymmetry is a good thing, it's a natural thing, it's a nice thing. But in this framework, okay, it's not clear. It's not clear that the supersymmetric states are rare. Or might be, they might be rare and exceptional. And the explanation of questions like hierarchy and so on might just find itself in 
the fact that there are just, just so many, so vastly many of these states that there are lots of them with light, for example, light Higgs particles. Okay. So I like to distinguish sort of three branches of the landscape, three branches that people have, have, have uh, isolated and understood. A non-supersymmetric branch, okay, this is the branch I just mentioned. This is hard to explore, okay, and it's basically hard to explore for just the reason I said, because uh, because these kind of simple analyses suggest that everything is going on at the highest possible scales. It's not, you don't have a lot, there's no obvious small parameter to control things. Okay. If you look at states with relatively small supersymmetry breaking, as I say, you, can fi you find that the number of states sort of per unit, F, F here is some measure of supersymmetry breaking, is proportional to lambda. Lambda is the cosmological constant uh, of, of, associated with that state times F to the fifth. So grows is a large power of the scale of supersymmetry breaking. And you pretty much, as long as, there are, as, the, as the spectrum is, is dense enough, you can pretty much find states at any, at any value of the cosmological constant. Now, there are, are among supersymmetric states, there are two branches you can distinguish. One, which is basically the set that were first studied by uh, Katru, Kalash, uh, Linde, and Trevedi, KKLT are states which I call the states with W not equal zero. For them, it was important that there was a non-zero superpotential. Uh, and these states, you, might ha you expect to have a roughly logarithmic dependence of, uh, uh, of SUSY breaking scales. Okay. So sort of, this is, I should say, uh, not something that's rigorously established. I think it's probably something we'll hear about a little bit tomorrow from Mike. But, uh, but sort of simple-minded arguments suggest that the scale of SUSY, the, the distribution of SUSY breaking scale should be logarithmic. And this is very much like we expect from sort of traditional ideas about hierarchies. So we expect that hierarchies arise, for example, from effects that are exponentially small in coupling, either the minus eight pi squared over G squared. Okay. Uh, and that's, and if the distribution, and, and I should add that the distribution of G then we imagine is something relatively flat. And in, again, in this kind of type 2B counting that Mike has done and others have done, uh, this is, in fact, what you find. And so you expect a roughly flat distribution uh, uh, of scales. And so the, a finite fraction of states, of, the SUSY, of these approximate SUSY states, will have a low scale of SUSY breaking. Okay. Now, there's also an interesting branch okay, which one, where sort of classically you have super, vanishing superpotential. And quantum mechanically, what one again would guess this means is that you have a pile of st up of states at, at small SUSY breaking scale, okay, something like you might expect from low energy gauge mediation. Uh, and the distribution here, this dn df now, is something like the cosmological constant divided by f squared. Okay. And this set of states, I say, is a, so this is a rather interesting arena. This is something that you might think might even have something to do with experiments we might someday do. Maybe not even, not in our not in Shimon and uh, Eliezer or my lifetime, but maybe over time. Uh, but uh, and this W equals zero is something that 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 might arise. I should say now from from symmetries. Okay, so W equals zero in in a in a, in a supersymmetric theory arises, for example, if you have some kind of R symmetry on some on kind of unbroken. An R symmetry is a symmetry which rotates the superpotential, uh, which rotates the, excuse me, well, it rotates the superpotential, it also rotates the, uh, the supercharges, and this might arise from those sorts of symmetries. So symmetries might give rise to something, to something like this, something rather distinctive, where the scale of supersymmetry breaking is low. Okay. Now, as I said, and I'm going to say, just say this once more, that non-supersymmetric states might vastly out, outnumber supersymmetric ones. So there might, for example, be many, many more states with light Higgs without supersymmetry than with. And I hear I'm using this dreaded word, but in such a such circumstance, if you're willing to invoke anthropic arguments, so for example, along the lines of, I want to blame somebody else, or Kani Hamed, Demopoulos, and, and their collaborators, uh, you might have, say, some anthropic selection for light Higgs, and perhaps just that's just the way it is. Uh, so the Higgs is light. Uh, this is the, you know, kind of this dreadful scenario for for the LHC, for example, that we just find a, a, a single light Higgs particle. Okay? Uh, so is this, is this true? Is this what, is this what emerges? Okay. Uh, among the supersymmetric states, as I said, within these hierarchies arise in, a, in, in the sort of conventional way we've imagined for a long time uh, in a finite fraction of states. Okay? Now, uh, warping with or without supersymmetry seems likely, again, in a 
I think most of the counting has been done in supersymmetric states, but you might plausibly imagine it happens in non-supersymmetric states as well. Uh, and it in fact occurs, seems to occur in a finite fraction of at least, this, again, within the things that people look at uh, of states which are counted. So this is another possible explanation of hierarchies. And it has very much the flavor, and in some sense can perhaps be thought of as dual, to, to the ideas of technicolor. Okay, so, so all these ideas, which again, which we've thought about you know, for uh, you know, m much of my professional lifetime, sort of have a home here, have a framework in which uh, one can one can think about them and discuss them. Okay, so I'm going to focus for a moment, for a few minutes, on this question of discrete symmetries. How how natural are discrete symmetries? Okay, and so I said, said while continuous symmetries don't arise in string theory, discrete symmetries are common, uh, and many can be thought of as, for example, unbroken subgroups of rotation. So it's rather easy to, to understand how how symmetries arise. Uh, so, for example, a lot of you have seen this picture of something associated with something called the Z3 orbifold. If you're not familiar with it, it's not that important. But, but the main point is that there's some sort of lattice, and the lattice has, has various symmetries. And so this lattice, for example, is, is symmetric, if you think about it for a little bit, under rotations by 60 degrees. Okay, and so we're, if we're compactly flying six dimensions, for example, we have, might have three copies of this. So we might have three, uh, three, uh, three such symmetries, three such Z6 symmetries. And for some reason on my computer, this shows up as an arrow, and in this one, it shows up as an exclamation point. So this is read zi goes to e to the 2 pi i over 6 zi for each i. Okay, so this is a, and this is an R symmetry. It's a symmetry because it's a rotation. It rotates fermions, and the supercharges are fermionic objects. Okay, so they pick up a phase also under this, under this transformation. Okay. Uh, for those of you who are, you know, more string aficionados, one of the sort of simplest and favorite colabiales to look at is the, the quintic in CP4, um, and and one typically here one has one defines this by considering CP4 and looking for, at some quintic polynomial, the vanishing of some quintic polynomial, some surface under which quintic, some quintic polynomial vanishes, and a simple one is this very symmetrical one, okay, p is e1 to the fifth plus e2 to the fifth, and so on. Okay. And this has lots of symmetries, and again, my arrows have become exclamation points. Uh, but uh, it has several Z5 symmetries under which, for, so for example, Z1 goes to alpha Z1, where alpha is a fifth root of unity, and so on. There are also permutations of the Zs, and so on. Okay. Uh, and these are R symmetries. Okay. And again, I don't know what my problem here is, but in any case, these are R symmetries, uh, and in particular, uh, the superpotential under these rotates by a phase the same phase alpha under this particular transformation, Z1 goes to alpha Z1. Okay. So now we want to think about flux vacua. So if I want to, I want to think about building some kind of compactification where I have fluxes. Okay. And so what, so, so what, are the flux, what do I want from these fluxes? Okay. Well, I'm interested in, I want to ask how many of the states, so, so I should back up and I should say, how do you get in this, in this picture, how do you get, in this Buso Polchinski picture that, that Lenny alluded to, how do you get lots of states? Well, you get lots of states by having lots of different possible fluxes, uh, and fluxes which can take on several different values, many different values. Okay? Uh, and, so the, and so I want to ask, among all these possible choices, okay, how many states respect some symmetry? And so I'm going to keep in, I'm going to focus on this symmetry. I really don't wish this. I hope you know you can sort of rotate this exclamation point in your head, uh, but uh, but I want to focus on this particular symmetry just as an example, okay? And you're welcome to look, you know, you're welcome to do this exercise. You're also welcome to show I'm wrong or something, and that there are exceptions, okay? But uh, but in any case, I want to ask how many states respect this symmetry, and so as I put down the fluxes, if I want to have the symmetry, the first thing that better be true is the fluxes that I turn on should be invariant under the symmetry. Okay, so I have lots of fluxes I can turn on. In this particular model, uh, well, you might have, you know, there, there are, well, well, we'll count the fluxes, but there are lots of fluxes that I can turn on. Uh, and, uh, and I want to only turn on those fluxes which respect the symmetry. Okay. So basically, what's the rule? Okay, well, in, the, in, in, in this Calabial constructions, fluxes are in one-to-one -one correspondence with complex structure moduli. Okay, so, the compl there, so there's some moduli which, you know, you can sleep through this slide and just listen to the result if this is not familiar to you. 
but uh, our one-to-one -one, uh, correspondence with these complex structure moduli. And the criterion that a flux not break in R symmetry is that the corresponding modulus transform under the symmetry like the so-called holomorphic three-form omega, or like the superpotential. Okay. So, uh, so basically what we can do is we can just count moduli. And in this problem, this is a sort of text, standard textbook problem, okay, counting uh, the moduli is just a question of counting possible deformations of this, of these, uh, of, of this polynomial, okay, uh, and we want to ask how uh, how these modu how the, how these moduli to transform under this transformation. Again, this this these exclamation points are driving me slightly crazy. This is again omega goes to right arrow alpha w. So basically, what we want to do is we want to find fluxes. Uh, the fluxes graph that correspond to polynomials, quintic polynomials, with a single factor of z1. Okay, so I've written some examples here. Okay, so. That's all we have to do. We just have to list these and count them. Okay, these are the invariant, uh, are, are going to be the invariant fluxes. Now, we have to be a little more careful here because, um, uh, let's see, I'm sorry, just repeating myself here. Because we have to do a, uh, if we're in this construction, in this 2B construction, we have to do an orientifold projection. And I've just indicated how that goes here. So we actually have to do another operation here. We have to project by, uh, some world sheet uh, parity and, we all, and also a transformation, uh, a, a, a transformation sigma in space time. And I've given an example of sort of an allowed transformation. Okay? But all that means is basically I go down this list of polynomials and I construct things which are invariant under, under this transformation. So for example, before I do this orientable projection, there are 101 such polynomials. This number is reduced by this transformation to 27. Only nine of these transform properly under this transformation Z1 goes to alpha Z1. So basically what we have is we have uh, 20, uh, a sort of 27, if you like, dimensional space of fluxes we could turn on, okay? But only nine of those, only a third of those, oh, we can actually only turn on a third of those, okay, uh, and, and preserve the symmetry. And I should add that what about, of course, to preserve the symmetry, we need also that the fields themselves uh, the expectations of the, of the fields preserve the symmetry. Uh, and the superpotential in this model, that we can understand rather easily. And you can see that there are lots of, in fact, there's a continuum of supersymmetry, of symmetry preserving vacua. So the superpotential is something of the form zi times some f of phi. The zi's are, uh, are these moduli which are, are these moduli which transform with one factor of alpha. Okay, and then times some function of other moduli. Think of these for a moment as neutral. Okay, uh, and basically what we get here is a bunch, uh, is, is a set of equations, nine equations. Okay, because there are nine of these zi. So the equations dw dzi equals zero give us nine equations, but we have a lot more unknowns. So we have a multi-parameter space of of uh, a vacuum of which typically a subspace preserve this this discrete symmetry. Okay, so among these there's well, we're certainly going to find lots of states which preserve the discrete symmetry, okay? But we have to still restrict our, the fluxes in this way, okay? So what's the significance though, of this restriction on fluxes? Well, again, how do we get large numbers of states in the landscape? Well, we get large numbers by having some n to the b. n here is a typical flux. b is the number of different fluxes I can turn on. And uh, we, when we talk about numbers like 10 to the 300 or what have you, we're imagining, say, that n is something like 10, n can take 10 values, and say b is 300 or so. Okay. Now, b is reduced by a third. So, of course, in the example I gave, the numbers were 9 and 27, not 100, not 100 and 300. But imagine this 100, this 100 and 300 for a moment. If this b is reduced by a third, if I could only turn on a third of the fluxes, okay, then I have vastly fewer states. Uh, with, which respect the symmetry than which don't. So I start out with sort of 10 to the 300 states in such a situ situation, and that number is reduced then to something like 10 to the 100. Okay? So states with, this sort of, with these sorts of uh, symmetries are rare in a picture like that. Okay, well, the example I gave was, it was illustrative of the method, but not that interesting, if you like, from the point of view of having large numbers. But you can sit and go down lists of, for example, tables of Calabiales, the Calabiales, for example, constructed as complete intersections in, in weighted projective spaces is a standard place people look. And this sort of phenomenon is typical. The typical you rarely keep, you, you, it's hard to find symmetries which are respected 
by more than about a third or so of the fluxes. Okay, so discrete symmetries look rare. This kind of reduction in the number of states okay, seems, seems typical. Okay. So we're stuck at this point. I, I sort of indicated to you I don't really know how to establish whether or not low energy supersymmetry is or isn't important in the landscape. It seems that discrete symmetries are rare. And in fact, in some sense, you might view this as an object lesson for this other question. Or maybe I should be forced to view this as an object lesson for this other question. Okay, that symmetries, as much as we have sort of had this dogma about symmetries, that it's, it's not so obvious when we have actually a framework in which, sort of, which sort of generates lots of theories for us. Okay. Now, as I say, though, perhaps counting is just naive. Okay, and you know, people, as I say, say this to me all the time. Uh, it's an obvious question, and maybe we should think about cosmology. And for this question of symmetries, again, I think cosmology is, is li it, it, you know, a lot of questions in cosmology are going to be extremely hard in a story like this, but some of these questions might be relatively easy. Okay, so as I, as I said at the beginning, metastability is the most minimal requirement we can make on states. Just the very notion that these things are states uh, requires that they be metastable. Uh, and as I said, in a naive landscape picture, the way we get lots of states is we have a large number of possible fluxes taking many different values. So as I said, again, imagine of lots of fluxes n i i equals 1 to some number b, and n, the typical n's may be, uh, I actually shouldn't say much greater than 10, n, I, I, and I should say, imagine sort of of order 10, the possible values of these fluxes, and b, say, of order 100. Okay? Uh, again, I think this may be a fault, the fault of the, uh, well, maybe this is the fault of the, I'm going to blame this on the computer again. Anyway. <laughs> All right. So, uh, all right, anyway, so what, in, the, in this 2B theory story, this potential has a rather simple structure. Okay, it's something quadratic in these fluxes, okay, uh, and multiplying times some, some function of the various moduli. And let's think for a moment about states with uh, small lambda. So I want to imagine some state which is at least vaguely like where we are, or maybe it's, I'm interested in precursors of states where we are. Uh, there are going to be typically lots of nearby states with negative lambda, okay? Uh, and lambda here should be of order, again, this is a mistake again, lambda should be of order n minus n squared, okay? And actually, you might write, want to write, call this minus b n squared, okay? But that's actually not what I'm going to care about the most. Uh, so what's the situation? Well, actually, I should back up, okay? The nearby states, actually, this isn't a mistake. I'm sorry, lots of mistakes, but this one isn't. The nearby states... Okay, are states where I get, I get by changing the n's by a small amount. Okay. So uh, changing n of order 1 will give uh, cosmological constants of order n okay, in the nearby states. And there'll be lots of states with lambda of order minus n. Okay. And for example, for this KKLT story, this is something one might expect. So this is sort of the picture, the usual picture people draw of the KKLT vacuum. Okay. So the idea is that there's some parameter rho which determines the size of the, or the compactification volume. Uh, here's the potential. And typically, the height of this potential for KKLT and for, is, is some small number, some exponentially small number, e to the minus uh, rho naught. Uh, uh, here's rho naught, this, this point here. Uh, the, the energy here might be, uh, might be a little bit positive, but you know, you know, we might be interested in situations where you can't see it on this scale. Okay. And out here in infinity, there's the, the, the energy tends to the energy tends to zero. But there are lots of other states nearby. So there's lots, you know, lots of discussion tunneling out to here. But there are lots of other states nearby, and they're going to almost certainly be lots of states that look like this. So I just changed the flux a little bit. Okay, lots of deep ADS min and min nearby. Okay. So what do we, what do we expect for the decay rates to such a state? Okay. So let me go, go back again and let's say, what's, you know, what's sort of the barrier height here? The barrier height is again of order n, okay? And the depth of the well is of order, again, of order n, okay? So, so what do we have? We have a situation, we want to think about decay rates, and I'm going to forget for a moment about supersymmetry. Supersymmetry, uh, as many of you will anticipate, uh, modifies this story. But it, in general, it has some potential Okay, scaled by a parameter lambda, where lambda is going to play the role of n, and I'm going to think of lambda as large. And there's some typical mass scale, which I'm thinking of as n Planck. Uh, and 
and it's just a function of fields, okay, and these fields could be both as moduli and also for a moment think of them as the fluxes as well, uh, then how does the balance action behave? Well, the balance action, even though the barrier is high, because the well is so deep, okay, the, oops, the balance action behaves as, uh, as one over lambda. Okay, this is a little bit surprising. It doesn't quite accord with your quantum, your quantum mechanics intuition is you make a barrier big, it doesn't really matter what the well is over here. You just tunnel through and it just costs you a lot to go through a big barrier. In the field theory, the scaling is, quite, is somewhat different, okay? And the balance action, in fact, falls like 1 over lambda. And you can see that in a variety of ways. You can see that by doing sort of standard scaling arguments. A quick way to see that, if some of you remember uh, Coleman and Callan and Coleman and so on, is just to, to remember how to, to think of this fun to, to imagine a, a, a thin wall situation, a situation where this function f has two minima separated by an amount of order epsilon. And then if you just plug in, you find that the barrier height is of order lambda inverse epsilon to the minus 3. And I want to just imagine now that epsilon is of order 1, or epsilon is of order n to the cube. Okay? So again, lambda is of order n here. Uh, and in fact, in this problem, actually, the rate's even faster. Okay, so this means the, the way that the rate is fast, right? Because we exponentiate. We have e to the minus this. And so we're getting e to the minus something which is small. Okay, and the rate's even faster than this if you really go through the exercise a little more carefully, because in this 2B problem, the shifts in, in these small shifts of, of uh, flux, these small changes of flux, the changes in these, mo in, the, in these moduli are also small. Okay, and so the bounce action actually is very small if, if you imagine that n is rather large. Okay, so the typical decay here, okay, is very fast, and if uh, you know, and in general, if, if there's no source of suppression, the tunneling will be very rapid. Okay? And notice, for example, that there are, you know, and you might have said, oh, okay, this is the landscape, and Lenny will give me exponentially large factors whenever I want. But there are lots of channels, typically, in which to decay. So, for example, if n is of order 10, I might imagine that I should think of changes in flux of order 3 or 2. And in which case, there might be of order 3 to the b decay channels, all of which have to be suppressed. Okay. So I claim this is, a this is a potentially serious issue. And we want to ask what classes of states are, are, are generically stable. Okay. And among this list of states which I, uh, wi which I described before, there are several candidates one might look at. So for example, large compactification volume, you might imagine, helps. And we'll see it does. Warping, uh, I actually will not describe here, but warping, well, warping is interesting. And I claim it doesn't look like warping itself helps much. Weak string coupling uh, by itself without this, okay, do, as, we'll, as I'll explain, doesn't, uh, doesn't help. We're sort of used to the idea that in field theory, weak coupling uh, makes a, leads to a valid semi-classical approximation, and then this sort of bounce analysis should be good. OK, but here, here as, well, as I'll explain, it doesn't necessarily help. Supersymmetry is, again, an obvious candidate. It's something that uh, I, I don't know who first uh, thought about stability in, in supersymmetry, but certainly Tom has been, I would say, almost haranguing me for any number of years about this question. And supersymmetry certainly helps. Uh, I thought that having light particles, light fields, sort of pseudomoduli, would help. And actually, Tomer Volansky, who's here, uh, convinced me that that's not true. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to mainly talk about uh, the one, let's see, one, three, and four. Okay. Yeah, right. okay. So let's do weak string coupling. I thought weak string, weak string coupling would be a good thing. In the 2B story, how do you get weak coupling, weak string coupling? Well, again, someone may correct me, but the only way I understand weak string coupling in the 2B is a way it was explained by Giddings, Katru, and Polchinski. But basically, what you want to do is play off RR and NS, NS flux. OK, so the potential has the structure. Yeah, this is definitely a computer glitch. I didn't write much greater than yeah. uh, V, uh, the potential goes like tau. Tau is 1 over, essentially, one think of as 1 over the string coupling. Uh, so the N, N, I, N, I here are the, the NS, NS fluxes times some function of moduli. And here, K, I are the RR fluxes, again, times some other function of moduli. And so to get large tau, which means weak string coupling, one would like to have K much bigger than N. 
Okay, so that's basically the strategy, the only strategy I really know, to sort of generically make uh, a, big string, uh, a weak string coupling. Okay, but what we want, so but now consider the following. Consider transitions where I change k by a small amount. Okay, so if I change k by a small amount, this is again not delta k much greater than one, but it's supposed to have a squiggle here. So it's clear the squiggles are, became these symbols here. Uh, then, delta, then the change in the coupling is order one over n, and the change in the potential is of order k. So again, these should all read squiggles. Okay. So our previous argument, our scaling arguments, uh, our, our previous scaling arguments, we just repeat them. Now say that the the bounce action okay, goes like an inverse power of k, uh, and uh, and is not is not large. Okay. So there's no suppression. So this class of transitions are not is not suppressed. Large compactification volume uh, does seem to help. And basically, just repeating these same scores of scaling arguments. Basically, just want to figure out where the v goes in this action that I wrote before. I'm looking to Tom all the time for approval. Uh, David Stelesso. Yeah. But um, but uh, but the uh, but you just want to go and figure out where the compactification volume goes. So you have to do some scaling arguments. Uh, and basically, what you find is that the balance action again. This is a squiggle. Goes like the volume divided by. Uh, this some typical flux to the fifth. Now I'm back to my n just denotes a generic flux. So it provided the volume scales in some fundamental units uh, as a rather large power of the flux. Okay, the states can be can be stable. Okay. Now in the two big case, this case I, this is a case I don't really I don't really know how likely large volume is because in the two b case. Okay, we don't really understand. We don't have a systematic, except for KKLT, in case it was with approximate supersymmetry. We don't have a nice way of controlling the volume. Okay, and so I want to think about this independent of question of say having supersymmetry. So with supersymmetry, as you'll see, there's a, you know, stability isn't really a big issue anyway. Look here, I'm. <laughs> yes, I don't. Uh, I, as I said, as I said, a lot of things here are, are preliminary, and this is something I'm aware of, and I just haven't thought through. Okay, yes. So, so uh, I think those also have approximate supersymmetry, though, in his states. But maybe not. Well, okay. In any case, I don't really know the answer to that. That might be an interesting class of things to study. Okay. There's, there's a lot I don't understand about that story because it involves, you know, you get exponentially large volumes from looking at small corrections to a leading Kähler potential, and I've never fully understood how that works. But that might be a regime, perhaps. That's a good point. It might be a regime where you have some control over this. OK. Um, well, since nobody asked me, I don't know if I'm going to do this aside on small volume. But maybe I should anyway. Uh, one of the things that bothered me as I was preparing these slides, I got more and more bothered by the fact that uh, I said we have no control over large volume. But on the other hand, without large volume, we have no control over anything. Okay, because all the analyses we do of these flux vacua are based on thinking about a, an alpha prime expansion. And without, without that, how can we even talk about this? And so we might say, well, maybe, OK, so maybe, maybe somehow, I got worried that maybe somehow this wasn't a well-posed question. But I think it is. And actually, this goes back to a remark which Shamit Katra made to me a long time ago, uh, which is that the KKLT story is, a large, is, is usually advertised as a large volume story. But once you've sort of gone through the reasoning that leads, that suggests there should be a large number of vacua of the type that KKLT talked about, with large volume, there actually is not clear why there shouldn't be lots of states with small volume as well. So basically, their argument relies on, uh, for those of you who are familiar, familiar with it, relies on a parameter W0, the expectation value of some superpotential obtained by integrating out complex structure moduli. Okay, and then, you know, and then you study uh, the, uh, this parameter, this field rho, and you argue that the distribution of W0 is uniform at small W0. Mike has done this, and, and, and Katra has done this. Uh, but if W0 is large, you still expect that you can find supersymmetric minima at small rho. And the same sort of arguments that gave you a uniform distribution of W, of w in, in that case, also give a uniform distribution of W here. So while you can't calculate these states, where you don't have a lot of control, these sorts of arguments sort of suggest, tell you that there are lots of states, for example, with, uh, in that case, say, supersymmetry, let's say, with large ADS radius and small compactification volume. 
So I don't think this question of small volume is moot. I think that, in fact, you would expect that there are lots of, if there are states at all, there are lots of states at, uh, at small volume. Okay. okay, well, so finally, the supersymmetry. I was going to put this in the middle or towards the end because I'm often accused of being a fan of this and trying to stretch the facts. But as I say, I really learned these facts from others, and for a while I didn't entirely believe, uh, believe these people. But in fact, basically, supersymmetry or uh, a, a, you know, approximate supersymmetry more or less guarantees stability. Uh, and, the, and the point goes back to, go, goes to the way one thinks about the positive energy theorem. Okay? So, and so in, in, if you have small cosmological constant, or imagine a, in some approximation zero cosmological constant, uh, and uh, unbroken supersymmetry, then in that case, just like you can define a global energy and momentum, you can define global supercharges, okay? and they bear the standard algebra just of a supersymmetric quantum mechanics, Okay, Q alpha, Q beta is P mu, gamma mu. Uh, and as a consequence, all field configurations have positive energy. So you expect that exact supersymmetry in flat space is stable. Uh, and this is true, and in some sense, what's a little bit counterintuitive here is in all these situations, we're talking about uh, energy momentum tensors which are not positive definite. Okay, so the reason, this is why you want this argument. Okay, you need this argument. But uh, this is, so as I said, this is true even if the potential, as, as we expect, is negative in some regions of field space. Okay? Uh, and you expect, and in fact, this is something that Tom has worked about on with, uh, with people at Santa Cruz, uh, you expect, in fact, that, uh, that this is, remains true even if supersymmetry is, uh, uh, is, is, is broken by a small amount. Uh, and as I say, this is something that really, these, the, the Tom and various collaborators have have thoroughly investigated. Okay. So in the last couple minutes I have, uh, I'm going like to go one step further. Okay, so so far I've sort of talked about what I view as a very primitive criteria very for states. Okay. And I've, you know, and I'm, you know, I've even sort of tried to suggest that this narrows the class of states that we would like to look at, uh, you know, that might emerge. And so... I, I gave you the five minutes. I, I yield my time. Uh, but uh, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Oh, <laughs> okay. Well, uh, but uh, and I said we've argued that discrete symmetries are rare. Uh, but I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm losing track of what I. You know, excuse me. This distraction here from the or from the chair. Uh, so as, as I say. So we've, we've argued a little bit. You know, we started out with this story that, that or sorry, I gave you this primitive criteria. Okay? But I want to go a step further. I'm not going to try and construct a measure for internal inflation, but I at least want to go a little further and think about what the dynamics, some kind of dynamics relevant to cosmology might look like on these states. And so I want to come back to these states with discrete symmetries, and I want to argue that they're interesting, that they actually define interesting neighborhoods. So if you like, the question I want to think about now is the question of sort of if in this space which Lenny and, and Steve and so on talked about of states in which we're going to make transitions and so on, what does that space look like? And I want to argue there are some interesting regions or neighborhoods in that space, and in particular that the neighborhoods of these states with discrete symmetries might be, might be interesting and might have some special properties, and maybe we shouldn't quite give up on them so fast. Okay, so... Um, Let's see if I can get this to work again. Yes. Okay. So it says that KKLT had this story, uh, the vanishing of these, this Kähler derivative for the complex structure, of vanishing this Kähler derivative for the complex structure moduli. And then they had a story of a non perturbative superpotential, which leads to SUSY ADS. And then they had something they referred to as uplifting, uh, which gave rise to SUSY breaking and small cosmological constant. Okay. Now, what does the neighborhood of a state like that look like? So suppose you found such a state. What might the neighborhood look like? Well, if I make small changes in the flux, I can still solve all these equations. Okay, so I'm imagining the flux is big, and so I might expect I can still solve these equations. So small changes in the flux, uh, I might still find uh, states like this. Okay, but now this W0 won't be small, and so the stability of rho will be hard to study. Okay. But I still might expect many small radius, non-SUSY ADS states, okay? And these might be problematic, okay?
Okay? And I don't know what lesson exactly I should draw from Steve's seminar. But in any case, what I'm, what I'm imagining here is I have this KKLT vacuum I drew before, and around it are sprinkled all these holes, okay? uh, uh, you know, you know, these, 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 these deep wells. Okay? And it might be hard to, make to, to find one's way into this rather special and unusual state with this small cosmological country. Now, I don't have any really substant thing substantive to say, certainly nothing as, as substantive as what Steve had to say, but I want to claim that the states with R symmetry breaking look different. Okay, their neighborhoods look different. So in one case, I have this, this sort of pot uh, potmark neighborhood with lots of holes in it. Okay, and here I want to claim things might look different. Okay, so again, how do we get vanishing W classically by turning off many fluxes? Okay, so now I want to, so I have some fluxes I've turned on. They're these ones of order 10. Okay, and I have lots of fluxes I've set to zero. Now I want to imagine I turn these on a little bit. One, two, three, but not 10. Okay, and I want to ask what that nearby state looks like. And in my guess, if you sort of look at the equations for the potential, okay, I have only hand-waving arguments for this. I don't have real calculations at the moment. But you might guess that the typical states nearby are de Sitter. Certainly a large fraction, an order one fraction will be de Sitter. Uh, and you might imagine that lots of them are. So the neighborhood might consist of an exponentially large number of de Sitter states. Okay? So, yeah. so the potential might look something more like this. Okay? So rather than have something with lots, I didn't draw the other one with lots, this kind of, uh, lots of pitfalls and so on, lots of negative states. But this potential, you might have a neighborhood that looks like this. Okay? And this might well be sort of a cosmological attractor. So if you somehow get into this neighborhood, okay, you might well end up down here. Now, I don't have a very, that's all I have to say about this. I don't have a detailed cosmological story, certainly not yet. Uh, but I would just, as I say, I would not necessarily, a while ago I gave up on the symmetric points, and in a recent talk, Mike accused me of waffling on this issue. But uh, in fact, I would waffle. I would say I wouldn't necessarily give up on these points yet. Okay, so. The title of this transparency, somebody looking over my shoulder said, wow, you have answers. It was, no, of course, I don't have answers. Uh, uh, but I think there are, I, there are perhaps the beginnings of a picture of how predictions for ra more conventional uh, particle physics might emerge from la a landscape. Okay. But obviously, there's a lot to do. Uh, and, but I don't think these questions don't look they don't, look all, they don't all look impossibly hard. So I'll end here. Uh, as many others, I, I, I will allude to the fact that it's customary to wish that, like Moses, one lived to 120. Uh, I, uh, my, my grandmother would certainly have said, would not have made this joke about 60 plus 60 being 120, because it would sound like you've reached it. Okay. Uh, and I certainly hope not. I hope certainly the rest of us haven't. There's a lot to do, and I'm counting on another 60 productive years from Eliezer and Shimon. Well, since I'm told it's raining outside and they're moving the food indoors, uh, we have time for questions. <laughs> so it's, it's not clear to me if your arguments about the decay rates were based on, on this assumption that the potential is disproportional to some parameter, or, or do they hold also when the potential on the landscape is the sum of many different terms that, that can survive as, as we might expect? It? Well, uh, well, I, I actually, I actually, well, my my uh, my attitude to this is very unsophisticated. So basically, I'm imagining I have B. Typically, if I'm thinking about a super so with KKLT, we're insisting that there be a, an unusual cancellation. Okay, so there's going to be a fine tuning uh, to get this very small W. I, in, in most of these estimates, I'm assuming that they're just a bunch of numbers which add with phases, and I'm roughly, and I, in my estimates, I'm typically assuming that there, if there are B terms, that the typical number is square root of B or something times that. I'm not sure how that's something one should be able to figure out. So for example, this estimate of th this, this claim that the nearby states and the symmetric points are DS is based on taking that, making that kind of picture. And, I'm not, and that's something one should be able to investigate, and I don't really reliably know. So KKLT, it looks like they do have additional contributions that don't fit into the Right, oh yeah, absolutely. So KKLT is, is, some, is, 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 is a special place in, the, in, this, in this story.
Yeah. I believe so. I, I, this is one, when I said a lot of this is, is preliminary, this is one of the things I'm not real comfortable about. But if I think about, so the question is, in a lot of these processes, what I was alluding to in a lot of these processes, in order to conserve various quantum numbers, you have to emit, uh, for example, D3 brains. And so the question is, so I just sort of drew a potential and made kind of a field theory estimate. And well, what's going on if you emit this topological object? And I could give you an afternoon's worth of hand-waving arguments why the numbers are consistent in each of the cases I made. I don't feel real confident about these estimates. Uh, and so again, this is one of the reasons why a lot of these statements are somewhat preliminary. preliminary My preliminary guess, so for example, in this case of weak coupling, I can, you know, I can, I can, I can make an estimate of the brain tension and so on. What, uh, part of the problem is that there are different ways people do it. So one thing I can do is I can say, what's the, what's the energy of this brain I emit? And that's always compatible with these estimates I give here. But there's also a story where people think about a, uh, some kind of membrane, uh, some kind of d instanton. And I'm a little less confident that I, I would be happiest if I understood that the d instanton estimate also, and I, and I think it does, but I'm, not, I'm less confident about that story. I, I, of course, this, if the rate's fast, it's a case where you don't trust the d instanton, but I'd like to see that, that it parametrically looked like this. So well, hopefully lunch is no ready. More questions, we'll break the rate. Thank you, Michael. A few announcements.